Hello and welcome to the Immigrant Incorporate podcast. My guest today is Farzad Khosravi, an immigrant to the United States from Iran. Farzad is a coach, a mentor, and a three times founder. Most recently, he founded a company called Cicero.ly. Farzad is a scientist at art, an immigrant with a passion for politics and philosophy. He believes that we should leave the world better than we found it. Farzad has worked for 10 plus years in customer experience and growth with a focus on customer success, sales strategy, and marketing strategy. Looking forward to sharing this conversation with you. Thank you for joining us. Hello, and welcome to the Immigrant Incorporate podcast. On this podcast, you will learn from lived experiences how to thrive in the corporate workplace as an immigrant. My name is Lola Adeyemo. I am the CEO of EQI Mindset and the founder of the nonprofit Immigrant Incorporate Inc. I work with organizations to build inclusive workplaces. On this podcast, I will be amplifying immigrant voices from within corporate organizations through solo episodes as well as guest interviews. It is a global world of work, and I'm very sure you can learn a thing or two from my guests who are originally from different parts of the world and their experiences working in the corporate workplace. Hello and welcome to the Immigrant in Corporate podcast. I'm excited to have a conversation with Farzad today. Farzad, how are you doing? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. I'm doing amazing. I'm coming off a long trip in Turkey and Greece and Croatia. This has been wonderful. How are you doing? Oh, yeah. And where are you right now? You just said you are still on the long trip, right? Yeah, so it just ended and I'm now doing just the work remotely in, in Athens and Greece. So, you know, just taking my time and really enjoying it as much as I can. I know. It sounds like I'm jealous that you get to work and travel <laughs> in all those places. Yeah. Um, but, uh, well, it, it's nice to meet you. Thank you for taking the time to join today. Um, so let's dive right in. Let's jump to your immigrant story. If you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and then where you are currently based. Yeah, yeah. So my name is Farza Kosravi, and nowadays I work as a interim head of sales and growth at various startups that need a fractional a person to take care of those things. I'm also the founder of Cicero.ly, which is a platform where you can discover just the most interesting things from the world leading thinkers, whether it be politics or or uh, technology, all the way to neuroscience and psychology. So. Uh, my story is, is an interesting one because I came to the U.S. right after 9-11. It was five or six weeks after 9-11. We immigrated to the U.S. from Iran, right, a Middle Eastern country. And we immigrated, uh, of all places, to Kentucky, uh, which, you know, a lot of people assume that, hey, you go to Kentucky, especially after 9-11, that will be a, a very intense time. Um, I don't know, to consider myself lucky or what it may be, or, or maybe it was it was just being imbued with, with these stories growing up of the hardships my family went through. But what I experienced as an immigrant, it, it didn't feel that, that difficult. You know, I, I remember thinking as a kid, like, oh, this is just how people tease each other. This is just what, what people do, right? And... It was very interesting because that's a very different way of thinking than, than I think most of us are taught in the U.S., right? Because I, I remember being told by, by my teachers at the time that, hey, Farzad, like what you're experiencing is, is really bad and it's racism. And, you know, as a nine or 10 year old at the time, it was, it was very confusing to me because that concept didn't really exist in Iran, which is kind of interesting because nowadays when I, when I talk to my Iranian family, I haven't been back yet, but you know, there there is a lot of racism in Iran. There's no doubt about it. But uh, they see it very differently. So as a kid, to me, it didn't really make sense. Um, but anyway, growing up in Kentucky um, and really love going back there now. It really does feel like home, don't get me wrong. But uh, when I was 18, I moved out as soon as I could. I just always dreamed of something bigger. So I was very, very fortunate to get a, a scholarship to Hamilton College. Uh, where I went to college, and, and ever since then, I've been working in software and, and starting companies 
And yeah, I consider myself very lucky to be in this position. Yeah, I love it. Um, so if you could go back to when you moved, did you move with your your parents? Were you by yourself? Yeah, yeah, I moved with my parents, and we were lucky to have family in the U.S. already. But unfortunately, you know, these moves can take a strain on on families, and my parents ended up divorcing, which for me honestly was a good thing because they, they weren't good together. Um, but you know, that meant that I was raised by my mom, who, you know. Growing up in Iran, you know, she never had many opportunities. You know, she had great parents, great family, but I remember her telling me, "Hey, Faisal, I wanted to be a hostess. I wanted to fly all around the world." You know, she was always told as a kid, "You're so pretty, you're so this and that," and she dreamed of like flying to Paris and taking pictures there and, and exploring the world. But that was something that she never had, right? That that was not even not even a a, a choice in her life, right? When she was, I think, 23, 24, her parents were like, hey, you're going to get married and here's who you're going to get married to. Yes or no. And she's like, I guess this is my life now. And, you know, seeing her raise me alone, it was, it was very hard for her. And, and a lot of that, of course, you know, being an immigrant, she didn't have access to all the things I did, right? The, the idea of therapy, the idea of let me talk about my emotions to my parents or to my friends let me seek help because i don't know these, these these were familiar concepts right so she she could only do the best she did but anyway a single mom raising me and my brother the most she ever made was eighteen thousand dollars having never had the opportunity to live the life she wants um i think that that really taught me that that the purpose of my life and what i want to do in this world is to make sure no one else has to experience what she did uh, and I love my mom. I always tell her, I'm like, are you happy? She's like, oh, yeah, I'm totally happy. Everything's great. I'm so happy I have such beautiful kids. But I know deep down, right, she still thinks about that 18-year-old woman she was and how she wished she could have at least done something, explored more, before she was forced into this life that she really didn't have much say in. And that's what drives me. That really does. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, thanks for sharing that. I I think that's a big part of the behind the scenes story that you know the things that impact our choices and and the decisions we make with our career, even, and and so let's let's go into the workplace a little bit. So what um what did you study and how did you get into the corporate world? Yeah, I studied government uh because it ended up being the easiest thing for me in college. To be honest with you, I always wanted to be a scientist because I saw science as the thing that makes universally a difference in the world and improves the world. Uh, but calculus destroyed me. It was very, very difficult. So I had to find something that was easier for me to do. And what made sense to me was to continue the entrepreneurship path because as a young child, I was really inspired by entrepreneurs. Um, you know, I, I mean, some of those people are now controversial, like Elon Musk and, and Steve Jobs. But back in 2008, 2009, you know, it wasn't very controversial. I mean, those were, those were the people to look up to. Uh, and as a young man, it was very, very inspirational for me. And I thought, hey, this is the way to make a difference. And really, as an immigrant, you have no choice but to, but to go to university, right? I mean, <laughs> I don't think I had any other option. My parents would have murdered me and uh, the society wouldn't respect you <laughs> if you don't have that. Um, so university right, was, we, was we talk choice. about that a lot too, right? Yeah, you have to go to exactly. college. Like, you don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah, and you got to become a doctor or an engineer. Thankfully, my brother became the doctor and <laughs> took that pressure off. I don't know if he put more pressure on me or it took the pressure off me. We still haven't figured that out yet, but at least one of us became a doctor. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, anyway, studied government, and I knew I wanted to go into entrepreneurship. It was very difficult um, to start my own company. Um, I think the, the classic things you're taught as an immigrant, but also is very, very prominent in American culture, is this rugged individualism that, hey, you in and of yourself can do this. And there's a lot of pros to that. It's very beautiful. And you see the pros when you come to uh, Europe. But there's also a lot of cons, which is that you can internalize a lot of things that aren't your fault, right? When I now that I'm older and I've got to work with a lot of these entrepreneurs, and I ask them, "Hey, how did you get your pre-seed? Hey, where did you get your seed?" 
And it's always a familiar story of like, oh, I knew this person. Oh, my, my dad was my first investor. Oh, you know, my uncle. And you're like, oh, so, so that's kind of how the world works. But, but, you know, you see these stories of immigrants, a classic survivor's bias, right? Well, out of like 1 million immigrants, two or three become rich and famous. And you're like, oh, anything is possible. And if, if I didn't do it, it's my fault because I'm an idiot, because I'm lazy, it's because I messed up. Rather than recognizing that a lot of it is chance, a lot of it is luck as well. And, and these things have to be balanced, right? right? And this internalization in and of itself is purely doing that issue. And it's hurtful to yourself. Yeah, and I think, I think just to be fair, a lot of things in life, right? Not everybody would have the same chance. It's, there's going to be a thousand people going after one thing and then two or three people will get it and people will hear about the two or three, right? But, but, but the fact is, as immigrants, we have less chances in some of these spaces and opportunities because, um, you know, that network is not there, as you said. That know-how, it, it's not there. So, um, yeah, that's true. So before you got into entrepreneurship, did you, or before you started your own company, did you at any time start working? Somewhere? Yeah, I did. did I you... mean, I started my first company in, in university, but then after university, I went straight to corporate world. And you talking about, you know, as, as an immigrant in the corporate world, I mean, I, I volunteer my time to do mentorship a lot. And the common thing I see amongst immigrants but also minorities and women in particular, and this is data backed as well, is that all of us, especially immigrants, we tend to really, really lack some of the, the traits that people who are successful, I mean, these, these guys and gals went to Harvard and, and UPenn, look as signals for, hey, this is, this is a competent person. And these are learnable traits, and they're very easy to learn. But our cultures typically uh, suppress it. So I'll give you an example. You know, I grew up always being taught, hey, respect people who are older. People who are older than you are better than you, smarter than you. They know more. People who are your bosses know more. They're smarter than you. And what that led me to do in the corporate world is to always see myself as less, right? And to always feel like, hey, like, I'm probably dumber. I probably don't have that much to offer. I probably don't know what I'm doing. Um, and as a result, what I would signal to, to the typical person who was a manager, which probably, you know, again, America is very diverse and we have very different cultures, but in the companies I worked at, it's typical startups. And what you find in those people is they value confidence, right? Um, and that was the thing that took me the longest to understand, right? That being humble and having humility is very, very important for a lot of us especially immigrants, especially uh, women, are, are taught to be too humble, too much humility, which in the eyes of, again, I would say a lot of the elites in America can come off as a lack of uh, ability or a lack of uh, trust that they can have in you. Because they're like, oh, this person can't even trust themselves. How can I trust them? This person isn't even sure if this is the right path. How can I be sure? It's been very interesting. Right. And and that that's that's a key one for, for immigrants, right? Is is based on how you're raised, the when you get into the workplace, your behaviors, your culture that you are bringing in is very dependent on your background. And and so I guess we're sort of going into that stage now to talk about some of the areas that you see that um reflected. So for you, when you got in, as you began to see some of those challenges, what are some of the tools that helped you um, begin to, to come out and, and to be more intentional about your growth? It was very difficult for me, to be honest with you, because, again, I had all these imbued behaviors and, and characteristics of, of always being humble, right? I, I, maybe you've already seen it for a little bit, but you know, there, there's all these studies not just one, not two, but very reproducible studies of how how women and immigrants will look at a job description. If it doesn't perfectly align with, with what they, they do, they don't apply. Well, you might find, you know, someone, a guy or a girl who went to, to Harvard, they'll apply even if it doesn't, if they don't have the experience, right? And 
once I started understanding these things, right? So you asked me what tools did I use? It was really understanding what are these cognitive baggages I have, right? That that aren't like helpful to me, right? Aren't helping me be the person I want to be, right? When I started understanding those things exist and then understanding what those things are, that really freed me. Because too much, too often we think like, this is who I am, I'm just not a confident person. But then you go to therapy or you know you just practice mindfulness and you're like, why is that me? Is that really who I am? When did this become me? When did I decide I want to be this person? Um, and you start being more I don't know, critical of, of the story you tell yourself. Yeah, that's true. Um, it's it's just a journey. Every I mean, there are tools that we can use. There are opportunities for the workplace um, to be better at acknowledging the challenges that immigrants have, right? Because just expecting everybody to be the same way in a group or in a team, for example, that doesn't really work, right? An immigrant might be quiet because culturally that's how they're raised, right? They're not going to say anything or they're not going to ask for anything. So some of the things that hold people back in a team setting, in the workplace, is cultural, is 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 uh, from the background. But some of it too, you know, is the opportunities we create, right? What are we putting together to make sure there's support? What are we, how are we bringing awareness to what people really need? So you talked about a little bit about therapy, mindfulness. Um, can you elaborate? Is that one of the things um, that's worked for you? I've heard about mindfulness before, but I've practiced. <laughs> no, 100%. Uh, it has worked because, I mean, I'll give you examples of this, right? I would, um, you know, I, I would have conversations with my managers where I would remember, like in the corporate world, I would present an idea, but it would present it in a very, like, oh, I don't know if this is accurate and I don't know if I'm right, which is a lovely trait to have, right? Like, I value that immensely in someone. But just because I value it, right, and I think it's good, doesn't mean the other person values it and the other person thinks it's a good thing, right? So when you when you practice mindfulness and you recognize, hey, I have these automatic behaviors that I do, right? Because I'm making assumptions about the world that are purely right. assumptions. And instead I need to be like, is this actually what the world is, right? Does this manager want me to, to, to act this way? Or does it kind of annoy them, right? I, I've had managers tell me they're like, hey, Farzad, you need to manage up more, right? And that's their nice way of saying like, you know, you're you're not you know confident enough, or you're not alpha enough, or whatever whatever term you want to use for that. Um, and it's it's really easy to to again something I, I find more often with immigrants clients that I work with when I'm doing my volunteer mentoring is they're much more often to be like okay like that's how the world is and I'm gonna adapt to it right I have a tough skin I have I have armor but it's also really easy for people to be like, oh man, the, the world is this way and it sucks and I'm a victim and it's very difficult, right? So again, you ask me, what are the what are the tools I use? I always try to remember my own family who went through a war and a revolution and all these crazy things. And somehow they came out of it stronger. And that's the story of humanity, right? The tool I always use personally, is like there's two ways to react to these things. One is to say, hey, the world is terrible and sucks, which is very important to remember that because that's what guides me to do good. But for my personal life, I try to say, hey, this is the way the world is, and I'm going to try to figure out a way to, to make it work for me. So yes, these people value confidence, and I'm not typically a confident person. I can be really mad and angry about that and be frustrated, or I can pick up the tools I need to be more confident. Right. Yeah. That, that confidence is a big one. And I think part of it is also because of course, when you get into a new workplace, um, when you get into a new space where you are new, where you are different, you kind of pull back and observe you. There's a period where you are looking at what's happening. And then when you see how everybody else behave, you know, sometimes you're playing catch up. It takes you a while. You sort of start behaving like you, you are less than, or you don't fit in. And then that naturally just becomes your default. So yeah. I, I think mindfulness is, is definitely a good way to 
re retrain your mindset <laughs> and, yeah. and find what you really want. And, and and Lola, I mean, one of the frustrating things, you know, I, I think there's a lot of really valid criticism against this like positive psychology mindfulness talk. Because again, it, it goes back to the classic thing we do in America, which is blame the individual, right? We say, hey, oh, you're having difficulty at work. It's, it's your fault. You know, just fix your mind. Go to therapy. Do this, do that, right? And, and in no way am I, am I discounting the sociological things at play that make it difficult for various forms of communication and being in the world to succeed. Um, but... I, yeah, so I just wanted to throw that disclaimer out there. And I'll tell you, like, a cl- again, another thing I see, like, I, I worked with this cl- client of mine who I was coaching. She was an executive at, at, you know, a public company. And I remember, like, she was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not really good at sales. So I need help with sales. And that's what she came to me for. And she would, like, say all these things and do all these things that a perfect salesperson would do. And I just, I was like, I asked her, I was like, Let's call her Ashley. I was like, Ashley, why are you saying you're not good at sales? Like everything you're doing, I'm listening to your calls. I'm seeing your emails. This is exact, like this is playbook good sales. And when we explored this more and talked about it more, it just again went back to that confidence thing. Because she would look at her colleagues, typically men, and but she worked with women as well who grew up in America, who went to nice schools, who were, have fancy titles, you know, senior directors, senior VP. And they would all like act like, they know exactly what they're doing and they know exactly what they're talking about. And she would look at that and it's intimidating. And right? she'd be like, oh crap, like, these people seem way more confident than me. They know exactly what they're doing. But I'm like sitting here like wondering, am I doing the right things? Like, let me hire you know, this, this guy who's like way younger than me to like help me out because that's how low my confidence is. And it just goes back to you know, these, these sociological things in our, in our culture where we all try to act like we know what we're doing. We all try to act mm-hmm. like we yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And and I know that part of the reason why I started Immigrant Incorporate um, is because we hear a lot about the few immigrants that make it successfully in entrepreneurship, right? And, and why is that? Um, we hear a lot more about that. But there are immigrants in the corporate world that nobody is talking about. And a lot of the immigrants that make it as entrepreneurs, they were in the corporate world and it didn't work. There's something about the culture in the corporation where all of these mindfulness, where we get to figure out what we want and do what you know brings us passion. The process to get to owning yourself in the corporate world is just different. The system there does not encourage and so that's why a lot more immigrants get a foothold as entrepreneurs. Um, but, for, but for me, when I started this um, nonprofit, it was to focus the effort back into corporate America. I work as a diversity, equity, and inclusion person with corporations. And being an immigrant is a huge part of the identity of that person, of that individual. What, is, what role does the, does the system have, the culture of the organization and and also what tools are the people that are making it in corporate? What tools are they using, right? So I love that you talk about mentoring. Um, you talk about coaching, right? These are some things that a lot of times um, as immigrants, people are not aware of. So I, I think it's important to understand some of the things that hold us back, some of the things that hold people back is not you, the systems were just not made to support you the way you need. And it's okay to seek help. Yeah. And it's so hard to get help for a lot of immigrants. I mean, again, why I, I volunteer my time to do mentorship. A lot of that has to do with, I just think about, you know, 18 year old Farzad or 22 year old Farzad, how much different my life would have been, how much better things could have been if I had a mentor who told me, Hey, like, here is a non-judgmental, psychological safe place for you to, to express your thoughts and get guidance on how to interact. And so many of us are, are missing that. And again, uh, especially as, as immigrants and minorities, I think we internalize that right away, right? We, we see these people, again, like Ashley did, who are like, oh, I'm doing this and this is the, the way to do it and I'm going to go do that. 
And she's sitting there. She's like, I'm not that confident about what I'm doing. There must be something wrong with me. Right. Rather than, right. you know, when you and her had these conversations, me being like, no, this is just, uh, frankly, I would say a sickness in our culture, which is that we all have to follow the, the most alpha figure. We have to act, you know, like we know what we're doing, even though internally we're all lost and we have no idea what the hell is going on, which is, again, I, I used to not know this until I became an executive coach and I would talk to executives I'm working on. They're just, just as lost as their employees are. But they don't act that way with their employees. And that, that to me is a, it is a sickness. It really is. I mean, there's a balance for everything. Yes, a leader should instill confidence in, in people, but everything in balance and moderation, not in extremes. Yeah, and that that's the thing. We always see we always see everybody else as more competent than we are. <laughs> and we don't see all of the fears and the concerns that everybody is struggling with. Um so thank you for sharing that. If you were so if you were talking to your younger self now, if we're talking to if there's an 18, 19 year old, I think you were beginning to go in that direction a little bit. 18, 19 year old with a similar background to you who is jumping into their first job in corporate America or who is in their job in corporate America and kind of feeling stuck? What are some of the advice and the recommendation you will give them now? Uh, to, things to think of. Yeah. You know, because I didn't have uh, a mentor or anything like that, I really tried to make my friends be that per- person. Right? Like, I think we all need psychological safety where we can express our greatest fears, our greatest anxieties and not be judged for that. And for me, the the logical thing is like, oh, that's going to be my friends, right? But just because they're your friends doesn't mean that the right person to do that for you. So my advice, and I'll caveat this by saying, still there aren't really great mechanisms for this, but there's more and more tools. My advice would be find a human being that can give you psychological safety, but it can also be a mentor. And is good at that, right? And a good mentor who gives you psychological safety isn't one that tells you what to do and how to do it because that person is just going off of their own experience, which is based on their life, their biology, their history at a specific point in time being a specific thing with whatever goals they have in mind and has nothing to do with you, but rather someone who can help guide you in asking yourself the right questions and again there's platforms out there like adp list and growth mentor which i'm on and and, and, and adore or mentor cruise all these different platforms things that didn't exist when, when i was younger but still these things are popular and they're not widely available uh, to right. people right and that's the yeah. sad part definitely taking advantage of you know because that's always the big question is well how do i find a mentor um, take advantage of all these platforms because sometimes I know it's not as easy as knocking on someone's door and saying, hey, can you be my mentor? Um, the disadvantage of that is sometimes you get stuck with the wrong person. As you said, you know, there's got to be safety aspects. There's, there's the competence part of it. So um, it's not just as easy as walking to someone's door and saying, come be my mentor. You have to make sure it's a right fit. And that's where platforms becomes important. Because there's so many criteria you can use to choose mentoring. So, I love mentoring. that you say that. It's so accurate because, again, people make an assumption. They say, oh, this person is doing what I want to do. Therefore, assumption, they're going to be good at helping me figure out how to do this thing. But those are very different skill sets. Um, and that person got to where they are totally different ways. You have no idea how they did it. Uh, you have a story, like, again, I often find people like to tell stories about how they struggled and how hard it was. But uh, when you dig deeper, like me, like I, I can tell a story of how hard it was, you know, I'm the son of an immigrant mom, single mom, making 18000 a year. But none of this would have been possible if I didn't have an extreme privilege of being brought to the U.S. and an extreme privilege of uh, going into university that was basically free for me, right? Um, those are the parts of these stories that are missing and they make it seem a lot easier than they are in reality. Right. And I think when we think of mentoring too, a lot of times people think of, I want a structured relationship, somebody that would meet me every month or every week and we talk about these and I'll write notes. And sometimes you just need 
a one-time mentoring. If you meet somebody that you really think, you know, will be a great support for your career. And maybe that's the reason why podcasts are getting really great. Because you can listen to an episode with Farzad and get a lot of, you know, insights that would help you in your career. You just got mentored, right? And you yes. can continue to follow that person and, and follow their work. Um, you can be mentored by people in different ways, um, not the traditional, the person I see every day and I have a meeting and I take notes, right? Thank so, you for saying that. Oh, my God. Because you told me what's the advice I would give. And you just made me realize that I would change my advice. And my advice would be exactly what you said, right? Now there is more information. And this is how I was able to, you know, quote, unquote, save myself. I was so lucky to be introduced to the part of the Internet that put me in circles where I'm listening to podcasts with world-leading scientists, world-leading thinkers, philosophers, getting introduced to them and being mentored by them in, in, in a way, right? In a way that like my father or other male figures or, or female figures never were able to provide in my life. That is, that is so lucky and unfortunate of me. And again, you, you said, what would be your advice would be to, to structure your life so that you're, you're getting that perspective from all these different people. All these amazing podcasts out there. You're, you're so right. So right. No, thank you. Um, I personally prefer it. I, I love books. I don't have time to read books as much anymore. But podcast has been a great way to, you know, get a lot of very tactical insights. So I would say, you know, if you're an immigrant, if you are an international student, if you are feeling stuck in your career, there are resources out there. There are communities out there. And where you can meet other people in similar positions and get ideas on the tools they are using. So that's mentoring, that's uh, support, that's community building for us. Uh, thank you, Farzad. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before I jump to my final question? No, uh, I think we've covered everything. I just, okay. all I would say is that, hey, we live in a time where we have more access to knowledge than the greatest kings could have ever wished. And that is an extreme privilege that we have today that, that gives us an advantage my mom never had. Right? She never had access to these things. Absolutely. Well, thank you for, thank you for you know, appreciating that and, and for the effort you are putting into giving back as well, um, investing in other people, because I think that's important. So my last question, it's the most difficult one. <laughs> so I like to ask about food. If you could, if you could share a meal with your coworkers from your home country, um, a meal, a snack, something from your home, what will it be and why? Is that yeah? What? It's it's a thing called tadig. So in Iran, there, there's a culture of when you make rice, um, you make it in a pot and you put it in, uh, a bunch of oil at the bottom of it, and then you put uh, either pita bread or, you know, rice on top of it. And over time, at the low temperatures, that rice or pita bread becomes very crunchy. Uh, so you have this, like, really crunchy bottom on top of it, of course, rice. And that's called tadik. And and it's one of my favorite things because I love crunchy stuff. And it's a very good crunchy thing. I don't know how else to describe it, but it's very good. <laughs> oh, nice. I love that. Can you make that? Oh, yeah, it's... Like it. <laughs> no, I like it's pretty simple. It's honestly so simple to make because again, it's just like oil. Put something in the oil and just fry it at really low temperatures for a long time with a bunch of stuff on top of it. So that pressure like presses it then to the pan. So the rice gets crispy as well. Yeah, the rice gets extremely crispy. Yeah. Oh wow. It's very is there, good. Is there any seasoning or any any unique seasoning or any meat that gets added? Yeah, I mean, typically it's good that yes, so typically Iranians might add you know salt and, and uh, to their rice, which you know most cultures do, but not everyone. And then sometimes they might put um, a saffron at the bottom of the pan with the oil to give it that saffron flavor and that coloring. Okay. Well, if you happen to work with Farzad and there's potluck coming up, now you know what to ask him for. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually funny. I've never done that. I should do that for next potluck. <laughs> It's a lot of tidy. See, see? <laughs> I just I just gave your coworkers a tip on what to ask yeah. you to bring for the next potluck. Thank you so much <laughs> for joining me, Farzad, and, and thank you for your insights. Thank you for the work thank you do. You. Um, I appreciate thank your you. time. Thank you. It's great talking to you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you for joining me, Lola Adeyemo, as always, for these important conversations on the corporate world of work from the immigrant perspective. For more resources and upcoming events, please visit our website, www.immigrantsincorporate.org. You can also follow us on Instagram at Immigrants Incorporate. If you are on LinkedIn, please join the group Thriving in Intersectionality Immigrants in Corporate America. There will be a new episode every week, so make sure you are subscribed to get notified. Please leave us a rating, leave a review, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you.